Speaker. Almighty God, we give thanks to you, the creator of the universe, and humbly beseech you to direct and prosper the deliberations of the members of this house here assembled for the advancement of your glory and the trust and wealth of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Grant that peace and happiness, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Amen, amen, namaste. or affirmation announcements by the speaker. <coughs> Honorable members, I have received communication from the Honorable Kamala Pasad Bissessa, SC, MP, member for Separia, who has requested leave of absence from today's sitting of the House. The leave which the member seeks is granted. Bills brought from the Senate, petitions, papers. Leader of the House. Thank you very much, ma'am. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the following papers. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Trade and Industry to the 22nd report of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee on the examination of the audited financial statements of Creative TT for the financial years 2014 and 2015. Papers two to five, the responses to the 23rd report of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee on the examination of the audited financial statements of Invest TT Limited for the years 2014 to 2017. The responses are from the following ministries. Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, Ministry of Works and Transport, Ministry of Planning and Development, and the Ministry of Public Administration. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Minister Finance. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the Exchequer and Audit Electronic Funds Transfer Amendment Regulations 2019. Reports from committees. Member for Faisabad. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to present the following reports. The 20th Report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on an inquiry into the oversight of state agencies under the purview of the Ministry of Education and funding to private secondary school institutions. Second report. The 21st report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on an examination into the approval process for land use in Trinidad and Tobago. Member Faruka Maloney. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to present the interim report of the Joint Select Committee appointed to consider and report on the miscellaneous provisions Local Government Reform Bill 2019 in the fifth session, 11th Parliament. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Miaro. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I have the honor to present the eighth report of the Joint Select Committee on Land and Physical Infrastructure on an inquiry into the effectiveness of measures in place to reduce traffic congestion. Prime Minister's questions, urgent questions, questions on notice, Questions for a written answer. Leader of the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, there are two questions for written answer. Both are available and will be given to members. Request for leave to move the adjournment of the House on definite matters of urgent public importance. 
Member for Carney East. Madam Speaker, in accordance with Standing Order 17 of the House of Representatives, I hereby seek your leave to move the adjournment of the House for the purpose of discussing a definite matter of urgent public importance, namely the increasing deaths of, to the H1N1 virus. The matter is definite because it pertains to the feelings by the government in controlling this devastating infection throughout Trinidad and Tobago. The matter is urgent because the H1N1 influenza virus, being highly contagious and has to date led to the deaths of at least 24 people within recent times. The matter is of public importance because this highly infectious influenza virus, if left unrestrained, has the potential to transform to a major national epidemic with the resultant deaths of hundreds of our citizens. Honorable members, I am not satisfied that this matter qualifies under this standing order. Personal explanations. Introduction of bills. The miscellaneous provisions, proceeds of Crime and Central Bank Bill 2019. The Minister of National Security. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that next stage of the miscellaneous provisions, proceeds of Crime and Central Bank Bill 2019, be taken later in the proceedings. Honorable members, the question is that the next stage of the miscellaneous provisions, proceeds of crime and central bank bill 2019 be taken later in the proceedings. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any against? I think the ayes have it. The miscellaneous provisions, age of retirement of judges, interpretation and chief judicial officers bill 2019 in the name of the Attorney General. Motions relating to the business or sittings of the House and moved by a Minister. Leader of the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, having regard to the interim report of the Joint Select Committee appointed to consider and report on the miscellaneous provisions, Local Government Reform Bill 2019, I beg to move that the committee be allowed an extension of three months in order to complete its work and submit a final report by March 31st, 2020. Honorable members, the question is, be it resolved that a joint select committee appointed to consider and report on the miscellaneous provisions, local government reform bill 2019, be allowed an extension of three months in order to complete its work and submit a final report by March 31st, 2020. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any against? I think the ayes have it. Public business, government business, bills second reading. The Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam, Madam Speaker, I beg to move. I beg to move that a bill entitled "An Act to Provide for the Imposition or Variation of Certain Duties and Taxes, and to Introduce Provisions of a Fiscal Nature, and for Related Matters" be now read a second time. Before you this afternoon, Madam Speaker, or before this Honourable House, is the Finance Bill 2019 which is designed to put in place the fiscal measures and various matters that were announced in the 2020 budget before this House on October the 7th, 2019. Now, Madam Speaker, there were a number of measures that were announced in the budget, but several of them do not require parliamentary action. For example, the life certificates for the removal of life certificates for pensioners, the increase in wages for URP, CPEP workers, and also for on-the-job trainees. These matters do not require legislative action. 
because they have been dealt with administratively. So that as of the 1st of December, the wages of URP workers has, have been increased by 15%. The wages of CPEP workers and CPEP contractors, the, the money paid to CPEP contractors, has been increased by 15, have been increased by 15%. And in addition, Madam Speaker, the wages or salaries of on-the-job trainees have been increased by 10%. With respect to the ban on styrofoam or the termination of the importation of styrofoam, that will be affected by way of uh, order that will flow from the Customs Act, specifically Section 44 of the Customs Act. There are some other measures which do not require legislative attention at this point in time, but are earmarked for the fiscal year 2020. In other words, between now and the 30th of September 2020, and these would include the tax-free structure for agriculture, refunds for value-added tax, the value-added tax bonds, the pensions for daily paid workers, Madam Speaker, uh, index linking of public service pensions, other amendments that we propose for the credit union sector, and other similar matters, Madam Speaker, which are in the budget statement 2020. What we are dealing with today are measures that are required to be dealt with before the end of this calendar year. That is before the end of December 2019. And this is why we are dealing with this matter on the 6th of December to allow it to go to the Senate next week so it will be done and completed well before the Christmas break. The matters that Minister Finance, or anything. Could you remember with the offending um, device, please leave the chamber. Minister Finance. The explanatory notes for the bill will explain what we're about. <coughs> Clause two of the bill amends the Income Tax Act to deal with solar water heaters. Clause three amends the corporation tax to deal with um, taxation of in life insurance companies. Clause four deals with the Petroleum Act, Taxes Act to deal with an increase in tax credit. Clause five increases the value of goods that can be imported without duties at the airport by individuals. Clause six amends the Cooperative Societies Act to increase the sum of money payable to a nominee or legal personal representative. We also have a list of amendments which were circulated earlier this week, several days ago, to give the opposition sufficient time to digest them. And these amendments uh, involve other matters that were announced in the budget statement, such as the amendments with respect to loss relief, claims for loss relief in the petroleum sector, and also the write-off of capital expenditure in the petroleum sector, Madam Speaker. Let me just go through the bill now. The first clause is self-explanatory, and it is simply the short title. The second clause of the bill is designed, Madam Speaker, to address the tax credit or tax allowance tax deduction that is given for water heaters, Madam Speaker, and the tax allowance for water heaters in particular, I'll come back to the energy sector matters in a short while, but just let me deal with the bill that was circulated and then I will deal with the amendments that were also circulated, Madam Speaker. At the present time, you can claim 25% of the 
of your expenditure on a solar water heater up to a maximum of $10,000. Now, the cost of a typical residential solar water heater would be less than $10,000. So at the present time, let's assume your average person acquiring a solar water heater would get a tax, a tax uh, deduction or tax credit, tax credit, sorry, of maybe $2,000, $1,000. Let's assume the solar water heater would cost $4,000, even $8,000. You can get 25% of that. So you might get up to $2,000. What we're doing now is allowing you to claim 100% of the cost of the water heater as a tax credit. So let's say the water heater costs $8,000, you can claim $8,000 as a tax credit. If it costs $5,000, you can claim $5,000. And we're taking that up to a maximum of 10. So we're leaving the 10,000 unchanged, but we are changing the quantum of the tax credit. The tax credit is now the full amount. So whereas before, as I said, someone might have claimed $1,000, $2,000, they can now claim up to $8,000, $10,000. So they, they can claim back as a tax credit 100% of the cost of a solar water heater. And this is just to encourage people <coughs> to switch to solar for their water heaters. For those of you, Madam Speaker, for those members opposite who may have traveled to Barbados, it's a phenomenon that's very evident in Barbados. Nearly every house in Barbados has a solar water heater on the top of it. And um, the Barbados government, in fact, subsidizes the cost of solar water heaters, which is something we may wish to look at in the future as we move towards renewable energy in terms of providing some of the electric power that is required for an ordinary home. So clause two of the bill seeks to amend the, um, the Income Tax Act, change the allowable credit from 25% of the cost to 100% but up to a maximum of $10,000, which we think would be more than adequate. I, I'm not sure that there are many domestic solar water heaters that would cost more than $10,000. And in fact, if you go to any of these um, uh, hardware stores that have sprung up all over the country now, I actually saw one of these solar water heaters that's somewhere in the vicinity of $2,500, $3,000, I saw so one in um, one of these places there in the uh, El Socorro area where they're selling them now for two, three thousand dollars. So that you would hardly get a solar water heater that would hit ten thousand. That would have to be a very big high capacity water heater. So we think this credit is more than adequate and should encourage persons to move to solar for water heating. With respect to um, the next clause, Madam Speaker which is um, clause three of the bill, we are doing a number of amendments to the um, Corporation Tax Act. And the first amendment will, the first and second amendments, this is 3A, 3B, and also 3C, they all deal with the whole question of allowing our exporters to export to countries within CARICOM and benefit from an export allowance. At the present time, there is an export allowance for persons or companies that um, export with, within countries outside of CARICOM. So if you're exporting to the United States or you're exporting to Latin America or you're exporting to Europe, at the present time, you're allowed to get an uplift on your expenses and claim it back as um, an expense. However, the regime at this point in time is limited to those countries outside of CARICOM. And if you go into the Income Tax Act and you look at the sixth schedule, you would see a number of countries that are all CARICOM countries. And so, and the way the legislation is currently structured, you can claim this export allowance except to the countries in the sixth schedule. So it means that you, if you export to CARICOM, you can't get this tax um, allowance. 
So what we're doing now, we are changing the, the uh, wording of the Income Tax Act in Section 10B, and the, the relevant parts of this bill are that the words where the service goods or agricultural products has, as a result of such expenditure, been exported to a foreign market other than a country specified in the sixth schedule, or the, for the first time to a country specified in the sixth schedule. And this is 3BB B in the bill. And what this allows someone to do is that if you are a first time exporter to CARICOM, you will now be eligible for the export allowance. There, there really is a sort of a general prohibition of this kind of activity within CARICOM. And this is why this regime has been there for so long. But we felt that it, it was appropriate at this time, the manufacturers had asked for it, that we allow this export allowance for first time exporters into CARICOM and we'll see what happens. And then perhaps we can adjust the regime accordingly after we see what will happen when we allow this export allowance for our manufacturers in to CARICOM. So that, that is what clause 3B, A, B, and C address. They now allow um, Trinidad and Tobago manufacturers to export to CARICOM and claim the uh, promotional expenses. It's, it's really, um, let, me, let me just clarify what I said. It's really in terms of expenses going to these countries meeting with buyers, advertising your products, and generally under the, the rubric of promotional expenses. So it's the promotion of Trinidad and Tobago goods, services, and agricultural produce. So it's really your airfare, your hotel accommodation, if you're attending a trade fair, if you're, if you're meeting with buyers over there and so on. It's those expenses, promotional expenses, that are now going to be allowed. Would we, oh, sure, yeah, sure. I have something that's a, a, a bit out. What about services for medical services where you go to get, because um, I see you have services there. People come to Trinidad to get medical service done, but the way it happens is you have to go there to promote the service. That, um, is, that, is that encompassed? I understand what you're saying. At this time, this is limited to the export of services, the export of services. So it's promotional expenses associated with the export of goods, services, and agricultural produce from Trinidad and Tobago to these countries. What you are, the scenario that you have asked me to look at is Trinidad and Tobago businessmen or service providers would go to another country, St. Lucia, Grenada, whatever the case may be, and promote Trinidad and Tobago services and in, that would invite and encourage people to come from CARICOM to acquire services. It's, it's, not, it's not intended to cover it at this point in time, but it's something we can think about during the course of, of the debate today, okay? And perhaps in the other place I could, I could deal with that, or maybe even today. I'll ask the drafters to take a look at that. Now, the next clause in the bill, or the next subclause in the bill, is the um, increase in the allowance for creative industries. We in this government, and I think anybody in this house will agree, that in Trinidad and Tobago, our citizens uh, possess considerable talent in the creative industry sector. We have decided in recognition of these talents, and in order to promote the development of existing and future talent, that we would increase the allowable expenditure that may be deducted in computing for the purpose of corporation tax, the profits of a company engaged in this area for a year of income. So what clause 3D of the bill does, it amends section 10G1 of the Corporation Tax Act to provide for an increase in the expenditure incurred by a company for the year of income of 150% of the expenditure up to a maximum of $3 million, increase that to $6 million in relation to visual works of art 
and performing art done by nationals of Trinidad and Tobago. I may also add that we are also making this available for the fashion industry. There's a, a further requirement that in the case of a visual work of art, the deduction may be claimed in respect of the initial acquisition of the work, and if it is certified by an art gallery, which also provides a valuation of the work. In the case of a performing art, the national rendering the work must be registered with the Ministry of Community Development, Culture and the Arts, and the Tobago House of Assembly. Now, the reason for this is obvious. You need to have some sort of certifying body that will create some sort of minimal threshold for the definition of what is a work of art or performing art. Because any, any um, charlatan would be able to say that they are an artist and therefore somebody who acquires um, goods from them should benefit from this allowance. So you have to have some form of certification so that we are asking for an art gallery to certify um, a painting, for example. And if it's a performing art or some other national rendering, the work must be registered with the Ministry of Community Development and Culture or the Tobago House of Assembly. So those are the certifying bodies. In the case of a painting and art gallery, in the case of performing arts and so on, the Ministry of Culture and the Theatre. We are also allowing this increase in the deduction for sporting activities, sporting events, or sportsmen. At the present time, the section 10L or I, I think, yeah, section I1 of the Corporation Tax Act provides for a deduction in the amount of expenditure for the year of income of 150% of the expenditure up to a maximum of $3 million incurred by a company that promotes or sponsors sporting activities, sporting events, or sportsmen and sportswomen. We're proposing to increase the amount spent on sports activities, sporting events, sportsmen and sportswomen for deduction purposes, tax deduction purposes, from $3 million to $6 million. And this is the reason for Clause 3E of the bill. This would include a number of sports such as basketball, boxing, martial arts, cricket, cycling, football, rugby, golf, hockey, netball, baseball, swimming, tennis, weightlifting, um, table tennis, bodybuilding, squash, chess, etc., etc. even Paralympics and powerboat racing, just to name a few. Further, a company that sponsors, sponsors audio, visual, or video productions for the purpose of local education or local entertainment or to reflect local culture for radio and television at this time is able to claim a deduction of 150% of the expenditure up to a maximum of $3 million in respect of expenditure incurred for the year of income. Clause 3F of the bill um, amends Section 10J of the Corporation Tax Act to provide for an increase in the claim that can be allowed up to a maximum of $6 million. So that is to deal with the uh, audiovisual sector. The next um, section or the next clause or sub-clause, as the case may be, uh, Clause 3G, amend Section 10K of the Corporation Tax Act to provide for an increase in the expenditure incurred by a production company of 150% of the expenditure up to a maximum of $3 million. That's what it is right now. And the, this Clause 3G amends that to change $3 million to $6 million for the year of income in relation to its own audio, visual, or video productions for educational purposes or for promoting or reflecting local entertainment or local culture for use in radio, television, or cinematograph works. So what, what this does is it allows a company that is in the business of producing um, audio or visual productions video productions for educational purposes, for local entertainment or local culture. It allows them, that company, 
to claim its own expenditure on producing these things for up to a maximum of $6 million, and it can claim one fifty percent of the expenditure. At the present time, they can claim $3 million, and now they can claim $6 million. And as I said, Madam Speaker, we also intend to include the fashion industry, which will be in the list of amendments, so that there will be, for the fashion industry, which is currently allowed as a deduction and is ascertaining the chargeable profits of the company for that year of income and allowance equal to 150% of the actual expenditure in good in respect of fashion promotions. This is now to a maximum of $3 million, and we will be increasing the tax allowance for companies involved in promoting the fashion industry from $3 million to $6 million per year. And um, we're going to renumber clause 3G of the bill to allow for that. Madam Speaker, there is a cap on the total expenditure that can be claimed by a company in respect of all the allowances that I have just outlined, which are under Section 10 of the Act. And at the present time, Section 10L1 of the Corporation Tax Act provides that for the purpose of ascertaining the chargeable profits of a company for a year of income, the aggregate allowance that may be claimed under sections 10G, 10I, 10J, and 10Q shall not exceed 3 million. So you can't claim for what? So you can't say I'm claiming 3 million for fashion, I'm claiming 3 million for radio, I'm claiming 3 million for sport. You can't do that. The, it's Three million at the present time for one, and three million for all. So if you're claiming for all, it, it can only go to the three million. You wanted to ask a question? Six. No, I'm coming to that. Okay. Yeah. What I'm saying, the current law, is the current law, section 10L1 of the Corporation Act says that the maximum of the aggregate of all of these things, fish, fashion, video, radio, television, sport, etc is the same $3 million. We are now increasing that to six. So now for any individual sector, a company will be, claim, be able to claim up to six million, or if you're claiming for more than one of these creative sectors, you're capped off at $6 million, okay? So that is, that is what this is all about. At the present time, there was an anomaly in the act with respect to a production company, a, artistic production company, that in addition to, well, not an anomaly, there was an, ad, there was an additional provision that in addition to the deductions allowed um, under Section 10K, the company shall be entitled to claim an aggregate allowance of up to a maximum of $2 million with respect to sums paid to finance sporting activities and artistic works not related to its own business. So if you're in production, if you're making videos and so on. Right now you could claim up to $3 million of your own expenses. But specifically for that type of company, there's, a, there's an allowance at this time that you could claim another $2 million for other things such as sporting activities and so on. We are increasing that to $4 million. So if you are a video production company, you will be able to claim your own expenses and also you'll be able to claim any sponsorship that you may get involved in, in sports and other creative industries that are not related to your own business. Currently, that additional allowance is $2 million. We're increasing that to $4 million. And that amendment is provided for at um, clause 3I of the bill. Let me move on now to insurance companies. At the present time, insurance companies are taxed based on the, what is called the statutory fund. Now, the statutory fund in an insurance company is a fund into which assets are placed, whether they are cash, whether they are bonds, whether they are equity, um, 
other, other assets such as real property and so on. So insurance companies at this time are required to have a statutory fund which has in it approved assets because this is there's a regime whereby the central bank will agree or not agree to certain classes of assets or certain types of assets to be placed into the statutory fund and there are limits on the amount that you can have in the fund with respect to equities, for example. You can't, the entire fund can't be created out of shares of Republic Bank, for example. It has, there's a limit on, on, on that sort of asset. There's a limit on other types of assets, real property and so on. But at the present time, insurance companies are required to maintain a statutory fund which has approved assets in it equal to the liabilities to their policyholders. We have changed the entire um, system of um, assets for insurance companies in the new insurance act. And, and there are just a few things left for the proclamation of that act. This is one of them. The, we have moved away now as the rest of the world has moved away from a statutory fund. And now you have to have cash and assets up to a certain amount within your, your company, so it, and, and it's now more than, it's more than 100%. So you, so you have to have a capital adequacy that exceeds your liabilities, and it's different amounts, like 150% and so on. So no longer do you have to place these assets into a statutory fund and sterilize them inside of there, and you can't touch them unless you, if you take out an asset, you have to replace it with an asset of equal value, approved by the central bank and so on. That regime has gone. And now insurance companies are required to maintain assets that exceed the liabilities to policyholders by a significant amount. But they're no longer required to put them into a fund that they can't touch so that it allows mobility of assets for insurance companies. But all of this is under the supervision of the central bank. So having taken out the, removed the statutory fund, the question was, how do you tax insurance companies? And the, there were many different um, proposals and so on. It's done in different ways in different countries. But what we have decided to do is a very, very simple um, approach to this matter. And we are deleting the taxation of the assets in the statutory fund, and that was at the rate of 15%. It is the profits derived from the investment in the statutory fund. So what, what an insurance company has to do now is you have the statutory fund, may have bonds, may have cash deposits, may have equities in, in, trading, in traded companies, may have real property. Let's say it has $10 billion in it. And that, that portfolio would generate income. So let's say you have a $10 billion portfolio of assets in your statutory fund, and that is generating 5%, let's say. So that would generate $500 million. At the present time, insurance companies are charged 15% of the profits uh, or the income derived from the assets in the statutory fund. So what we, so we are abandoning the concept of a statutory fund. We are now taking the assets that support the liabilities and applying the taxation to that. So let's say an insurance company has liabilities of $6 billion and is required to have assets of $8 billion. We are now going to tax the, the profits derived from those assets. They're no longer in a statutory fund. They're held by the insurance company. So it's a very simple move from 15% of the income from the assets in the statutory fund to 15% of the assets supporting liabilities to Trinidad and Tobago policyholders. So it's just a shift. It's, it's a very simple and very elegant, in my opinion, um, change, policy change. And this is in discussion with the insurance companies. We've been talking to them for quite a long time. And um, just to give you some background, the Insurance Act was assented to uh, a little over a year ago. It's currently awaiting a day for 
proclamation, one of the issues we had was this. We had to have dialogue with the industry, dialogue with stakeholders. We hired a consultant, and this is what has come out of that. And as I said, I, we consider it to be somewhat elegant, quite a, a simple sideways move. And the, there are some other th issues. I think we have laid them in this parliament, um, Attorney General, yeah. that, that the central bank had asked for certain amendments to the Insurance Act. But this is how these things happen. You know, you go through a process for years, and you lay it in parliament, you debate it, you pass it, and then an authority comes in and say, look, there's some things that we may not have remembered to tell you at the time. So we have some amendments to the central, that have come from the central bank already laid in this house a couple of weeks ago. And once we sort that out, um, everything should be fine. I think we also laid the regulations as well. So, so we had a number of regulations for the insurance industry as well that it was thought it was necessary to get that sorted out before we go to the new regime. And those have been laid as well in this um, parliament. So that, just to summarize, uh, since the statutory fund, since the statutory fund will no longer be available as the tax basis for long-term life insurance companies, the new methodology surrounding the 2018 legislation for holding assets will be Mr. Finance, I know you could rise above that. You know, I, it's so funny. When you're quarreling with them, they vex. When you're, trying, when you're trying to speak to them nice, they vex. What it is all you want? I think it's a compliment. Please, please proceed. You can rise above that. It's a compliment. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I wasn't rising or, or sinking in any way. I was just making a comment. So that the statutory fund will no longer be available as a tax basis for long-term life insurance companies. The new methodology surrounding the 2018 legislation for holding assets will replace the existing basis for taxation of life insurance companies. <clears throat> we believe that the new methodology will have a minimal marginal impact on the tax position of insurance companies, whether positive or not, and it will be simple and very quickly implementable. And as I said, we have spoken to the industry and the stakeholders, and they uh, have no um, problem with that. The, the, the bill itself, let me go through now the bill. This is 3K. Three, three, um, there are a number of consequential amendments to the fourth schedule of the Corporation Tax Act to establish this new methodology. The existing method for computation of profits for taxation under Paragraph 3.1 of the fourth schedule of the Corporation Tax Act will be retained. The tax position will be substantially the same as under the old Insurance Act. Insurance companies and the Association of Trinidad and Tobago Insurance Companies have confirmed the understanding of the new methodology and its ease of implementation. And the proposed new taxation basis retains the link to the regulatory framework by reference to the requirements in the Insurance Act 2018. So that I don't think that it is necessary for me at this time to go into any great detail into the intricacies of the words in Clause 3J and so on, Madam Speaker. Suffice it to say that we are changing the computation of taxation for insurance companies from the um, amendments that were circulated, Madam Speaker. And this flows from the budget statement. And what we are seeking to do in this um, clause, Madam Speaker, in clause four, let me, um, yeah, I know. But let me um, go back to clause two. The clause two of the bill states that the Income Tax Act is amended in section 48C by deleting the words 25% and substituting the words 100%. Sorry, that's, that's the um, water heaters. Let me go to the list of amendments. We are asking for the, the two that is before us to be deleted. 
and replaced with the following new clauses. And essentially, the replacement would be in 2B of the amendments, which is subject to subsection 2 in section 16 of the Income Tax Act, where the amount of loss incurred in the layer of income in any production business carried on by any person, either solely or in partnership, is such that it cannot be wholly set off against his income from other sources for the same year, the amount of such loss shall, to the extent to which it is not allowed against his income from other sources for the same year, be carried for forward and shall, subject as is hereinafter provided, be set off against up to 75% of what would otherwise have been his chargeable income for succeeding years. At the present time, they, they can carry forward um, losses up to 100%. So what this does, if, if um, petroleum companies incur significant losses at the present time, they can carry forward these losses for many years for 100% of their amount. We are now reducing that to 75% and is after lengthy conversation and discussions with the energy sector companies. And what the effect of this is, is to increase the um, tax revenue coming in to the Treasury. Because previously, with the 100% write-off provision carrying forward for so many years, no um, revenue might have come at all. In fact, when we first came into office, and I think you may have heard this before, we were visited by one of the largest oil companies that said, based on the current taxation regime, they would um, not be paying us any corporation tax for, for, for many years, right up to 2024, actually. So we've, we've done some adjustments <coughs> to see if we can improve the revenue stream for the government, and this is one of them. So, um, Madam Speaker, in, in terms of, and, and you need consequential amendments, so we have to amend the Income Tax in Aid of Industry Act, and this would be a new Clause 7 that is inserted after the existing Clause 6, and the new Clause 7 will be as follows. The Income Tax in Aid of Industry Act is amended in Section 16 by repealing subsection 1B, in Section 17A by repealing subsection 2 and substituting the following subsection. For the purposes of Section 111B of the Income Tax Act, where on or after the 1st January 2020, this ties back to why we are dealing with this now, a person carrying on production business incurs expenditure on the provision of machinery or plant for the purposes of the trade, there shall be made to him an allowance of 25% of the expenditure calculated on a straight line basis for five consecutive years, come in, come in, sorry, 20% of the expenditure calculated on a straight line basis for five consecutive years commencing in the year of expenditure. So this ties into the loss relief. Right now, companies can claim 100% of the loss incurred in, in drilling a well, for example. And, and quite often result in is a situation where a, an individual who arrives at the airport, at this time, any person, any person arriving at the airport is allowed up to $3,000 on goods purchased abroad, duty-free and tax-free. So at the present time, your allowance when you're coming in at the airport for goods that you bought abroad is 3000 we are now increasing that to $5,000, and it's in recognition of the fact that um, the $3,000 has been there to, uh, for a very, very long time. I think it's there since 2005, is what my memory tells me. And um, this allowance is in addition to what is already enjoyed by passengers relating to wines and spirits, um, where uh, someone can bring in up to 1.5 liters of wines or spirits, alcohol, and 250 grams of tobacco, not sure how much that is, not being a smoker. Cigars, not exceeding 50 in number per year, and cigarettes, not exceeding 200 in number per annum. So at the present time, there are allowances for cigarettes, alcohol, tobacco, and cigars. So this increase from 3,000 for goods purchased abroad, duty-free, 
to 5,000 does not involve these other allowances that people have to bring in alcohol and spirits for your personal use. The, the um, items, of course, must be for your personal use, not for trade. So let us move now to the next clause in the bill, which is clause six. Clause six now renumbered as clause seven. And this would amend section 41.3 of the Cooperative Societies Act, which is chapter 8103, by increasing the value of shares or interest payable on shares that a society may transfer to a nominee or legal person representative of a deceased member from $5,000 to $50,000. At, at this time, Madam Speaker, the credit unions are only allowed to give uh, $5,000, up to a maximum of $5,000 from the account of a member. So if a, mem a credit union member has an account with, say, $100,000 in it, and the person passes away, and their legal personal representatives wishes to withdraw for the funeral expenses, right now they can only withdraw. Honorable five. member, one more minute to wind up, please. Sure. They can only withdraw 5000 We are increasing that to $50,000. And Madam Speaker, the last section in the bill is um, a commencement clause. And this commencement clause is to deal with the insurance industry. Because we haven't proclaimed the Insurance Act yet, so we need to have a commencement clause when we are changing the way we tax insurance companies. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, this bill seeks to put into law the matters that we had proposed in the budget statement of 2020, dealing with personal allowance at the airports, uh, credit unions, uh, energy sector, life insurance companies, solar water heaters, and so on. I beg to move. Honorable members, I shall now propose the question for debate. The question is that a bill entitled an act to provide for the imposition or variation of certain duties and taxes and to introduce provisions of a fiscal nature and for related matters be now read a second time. I recognize the member for Karuni Central. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My colleagues have observed that the Minister of Finance was a little subdued today. But he did present the bill, and it is good for all of us to note that the people are sovereign and that the people are the ones who have the power. Sometimes we forget that. The Finance Bill 2019, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is a bill which gives effect to some, not all, of the fiscal measures announced in the 2020 budget statement. And the question did arise when I saw the bill as to why some and not all, and the minister sought to explain that by indicating that there are issues such as URP, CPEP, OJTs, this styrofoam issue which can be dealt by order. And, but it would have been good to debate some of those issues because they have implications for the economy itself, not just the fiscal measures, but for the economy itself. And he also mentioned that by the 30th of September 2020, the issue of incentives for agriculture 
VAT bonds and the index linking, uh, the linking of pensions, indexation of pensions would be dealt with, which means that those matters may well have to be addressed uh, by us at some point. So the theme out of the theme of the budget out of which these measures come, these fiscal, fiscal measures, was stability, strength, and growth. And the meaning of that, if we might interpret it, is that the 2020 budget was meant, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to stabilize the economy. It would improve economic performance and so strengthen the national economy. It would cause the economy to grow. So the fiscal measures announced in the 2020 budget to which this bill speaks are meant to achieve these things. And today, after this debate, we write these fiscal measures announced earlier in the budget into law. But Mr. Deputy Speaker, I doubt very much that the implementation of these measures from January 2020 will bring the promised stability that they will strengthen the economy and stimulate the growth. I can say that because the other fiscal measures in the last four budgets before this did not achieve what the Minister of Finance said they would, in fact, achieve. The 2020 budget, as I said, was stability, strength, and growth, and I'm claiming that they will not achieve that with these fiscal measures. The 2019 budget was the famous one entitled Turnaround, <laughs> which became Turn the Corner. And I think we know by now that that was not achieved because the latest statement by the World Bank indicated, indicates that contrary to the projection of the Minister of Finance of 1.9% growth for 2019, that in fact the best it's likely to do is zero. That is the World Bank pronouncement. The budget before that was themed changing the paradigm, putting the economy on a sustainable path. That was the one, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with the game changers. And I don't want to go into any detail on that because I want to deal with the details of the bill. But we know what happened to the game changers the game changers actually collapsed. The budget before that, 2017, was called Shaping a Brighter Future, a Blueprint for Transformation and Growth. And that was the budget with the taxes, the taxes on corporations, uh, raising to 30% from 25 and raising for banks uh, from, to 35 and then the 2016 budget, which was their first budget, was restoring confidence and building trust. Let us do this together. And we know since then, precisely because of, the two, because of two issues. In 2016, they raised the business levy, and they raised the green fund levy. And then in 2017, they dropped the 5% tax on corporations and the 10% tax on the banking industry. And the end result of that was that they sealed lack of confidence for the entire period of their tenure in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, what are the fiscal measures being addressed in the Finance Bill 2019? The first is located on page 136 of the 2020 budget statement. And that involves an increase in solar water heating equipment tax credit from 25% to 100% of the cost of solar water heating equipment. But it does so up to the maximum of $10,000.
Now, to achieve this increase in tax credit, this finance bill amends 48C, according to the document here, by deleting the words 25% and inserting the words 100%. But there are two problems. The first, the first thing is that 48C was repealed in 1997, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I could not find any documentation which said that 48C was reinstated. And unless this clause reinstates 48C, we have a problem, uh, because I don't see how it can do it. The provision that makes sense, that it makes sense to amend is in fact 48M of the Income Tax Act. So we need to look at that, because 48C, you see I have it here, the Laws of Trinidad and Tobago Income Tax Act, Chapter 7501, and it says, repealed by Act Number 9 of 1997, 48B to 48E, so there is no 48C. But later on in 48M, it says, where an individual in a year of income commencing 1st January 2011 purchases solar water heating equipment for household, to use, household use, that individual shall be entitled to a tax credit of 25%. That is now amended to to 100%, so that is the, actually the appropriate clause, 100% of the, clause of the cost of the solar water heating equipment, up to a maximum of $10,000. And that is the second problem. It's not just a clause. The, the point I want to make is that the limit remains $10,000. Whether it is a 25% credit that yields a benefit, $10,000, or a 100% tax credit, if the end result of the application of a 25% credit and the application of a 100% tax credit is the same, then nothing has changed, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because the limit of the benefit has not increased, notwithstanding the percentage increase. So the limit that the taxpayer could get for using a water heater that was driven by solar energy would have been 10% in 2018, and it will be $10,000 $10, in 2019 and 2020 and whenever else this bill continues, so that there really is no change except the percentage change. The quantum remains the same. The amount of actual credit benefit and the relief for the citizen will not change the citizen's relief is still $10,000 as it was. I don't know, the minister said it, um, and when he said it, it did not seem, I was wondering if there was a mistake and that they wanted to increase the quantum, but it is clear that the minister does not want to increase the quantum. He simply increased the percentage and the limit remains the same, so the benefit has not increased to the citizen. I want to make that clear. The real benefit to the citizen has not increased. The second fiscal measure being written into law here is Clause 3, and it's an amendment to the Corporation Tax Act. There are three parts to this. The first one has to do with incentives for creative industries. The tax allowance has been increased from $3 million to $6 million for the corporate sponsorship and this is mentioned on page 139 of the 2020 budget statement. Uh, for nationals in local film industries, audio, visual, or video production for the purpose of the local, of, for local education or local entertainment, and sporting activities or events, or sportsmen and art and culture. Production companies also who make their own audio, visual, or video production will also benefit sim similarly. Production companies who sponsor sporting activities and artistic works can now make a deduction of up to four million. It used to be two million before. What happened, I thought for a minute that the fashion industry was left out here. 
because I did not see it in the bill, but I, I heard the minister, I didn't get it clearly because, but I heard the minister say you will insert a clause that would include the fashion industry. Is that true, minister? Right, so it looks like the fashion industry is going to be included, and that is very good. Um, so that issue is clear, cleared up, so that is for the creative industries. Now, I think, I think that it is reasonable to, to ask as a first question, how many companies actually use the $3 million benefit to support activities like these, whether fashion or sport, video production, and whether, in fact, the incentive has been working. I think that would help us if the minister could let us know, because that would let us that help us to understand what has been happening. With the increase of the allowance to six billion, sponsors may benefit if they use it. But what would be the real impact on sports, video production, fashion, etc.? Because after all, the fiscal measures are meant to yield a result. We need to identify what the results are that we want to achieve and figure out how to realize them. Now, the other issue that might be appropriate is not whether the companies are using this and whether it is making a difference in terms of expansion of the creative arts sec sector, but whether this would now mean, these measures would now mean a reduction in state support for areas such as the arts, sports, uh, fashion, etc. So I think it would be useful for the minister to tell us something about that. And finally, how will the success of this incentive meant to benefit creative industries and sports be measured and evaluated for effectiveness? How will we know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the incentives are, in fact, working. The second incentive within this framework is the increase in taxable allowance for promotional expenses incurred for export purposes. Now, these are normal expenses for businesses. But if the idea is to increase first-time exports to CARICOM, and exports outside of CARICOM as well, should there be a limit at all? For is not the real result that we are seeking to achieve an increase in export sales, and the real result that we are trying to achieve as well is to realize an increase in foreign exchange earnings. In addition, what is a first-time export to CARICOM? And I'm not saying this um, facetiously. Does it mean a first-time entry of a new product or a first-time entry of a TT company in a market or both? So, for instance, a company may be already exporting but not products. Why? Does that, will that be counted as a first-time entry or Will it be, because they are already in CARICOM, not counted? It would be simply an expansion. So that needs some clarification. And of course, I would understand it to mean that if you export it for the first time ever, that you would receive this benefit. Now, we may also ask the question, is export expansion a function of promotions or a function of other things that might be even more important than promotions, such as the investment environment, the confidence level to support proactive interventions, the ease of doing business matrix, and the competitiveness of country and of industry. Are we looking at the right things, Minister, through you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, or are you doing something to say that you are doing something. It, this is important because at the end of the day, all of us know we have a foreign exchange earnings crunch. 
And all of us know that export is the only real success that we need put to pursue for industries located in Trinidad and Tobago. The business of export goods manufactured here, services created here, and agricultural products for exports is a very important one that needs deliberate action. I do acknowledge that this is an attempt to do so, but I question whether this is the incentive that will lead to increased exports and increased foreign exchange earnings. And I mention again the tax-free agriculture identified in the budget is not taken into account in this bill. I guess the minister answered that when he said that that particular matter will be dealt with in September. But it seems to me that this is something that we should be dealing with here. Now, there is a clause in the bill, there is a clause in the bill which says, where the service goods or agricultural produce has as a result of sort, such expenditure been exported. But I do not know if that means that it is purely raw agricultural products, because the whole purpose behind the position of the minister when articulated in the budget was that he would create a tax-free agricultural industry. And there's nothing in this bill that addresses that. It is possible that it may be addressed in September 2020, as he uh, indicated. But what I would say is that in this bill, nothing is really done for agriculture as committed in the budget of 2020. The third issue which arises through the amendment, through amendment of the Cooperation Act, Act is the replacement of the statutory fund requirement for insurance companies with assets now supporting liabilities to Trinidad and Tobago policyholders, because that is the change in the bill. In the Insurance Act of 2018, provision for statutory fund to be eliminated was made. These amendments eliminate the statutory fund requirement and creates a new formula for calculating the profit of life insurance companies. This is to make good on the commitment of the budget statement on page 132 of the 2020 budget statement. Currently, profits for insurance companies derived from investment of the statutory fund is taxed at 15%. And there is a further 25% taxation rate if the profits from the statutory fund are transferred to the shareholders' account. And that, of course, it's 25%, but you minus the 15% on the portion being transferred because taxes would have already been paid on that. The Insurance Act replaced the statutory fund with a risk capital adequacy requirement. The bill, this bill seeks to realize this change and to legalize it, and to legalize the new framework. The quantum of tax, though, does not change, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It still remains 15% on profits, on the assets supporting the policyholders, and 25% on the transfers to the shareholders' account, minus, of course, any 15% that might have been paid before. So the taxation change is nil. It is that the legislation is now required to put into effect what the 2018 insurance bill uh, did, which is to abolish the statutory fund and find a new formula for taxation. Clause four comes from the fiscal measure announced to increase investment tax credit for energy companies from 20% to 25%. The minister says that this will stimulate further exploration and development related investments in the energy sector, but I do not think so. Mr. Deputy Speaker. The impact of the change is negligible. I referred to that. Ernst and Young had made a comment on it with their review of the budgetary fiscal measures. 
and it will not make a difference in exploration and development and production. But it does not hurt, I will say that. It doesn't take anything away. It does not hurt, but it will not be any great incentive. The government, after four years, have not collectively dealt comprehensively with our energy sector. And their intermittent and disconnected interventions have actually put the sector at risk, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I am not saying that this 5% increase puts anything at risk. As I said, it will cause no harm. But the mishandling of the entire sector is what is per problematic. The increased 5% in respect of SPT applies to qualifying expenditure for approved development activity in mature marine oil fields, mature land oil fields, and the acquisition of plant and machinery used in approved enhanced oil recovery projects. Now, mature marine oil field is, this, is defined as an oil field that is 25 years or older from the first date of its commercial production. For this to benefit a company, the price of crude has to be over 50 US dollars. But our major energy production business is natural gas, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Will 25-year-old mature gas fields qualify for this benefit? I hope the minister would, will answer, because I do not think that it does the way the bill is written. So I don't think the law here addresses the itch issue of a 25-year-old natural gas well, OK? And in a sector where oil production is declining, does the minister not think, and I'm asking him through you, Deputy Speaker, that we need more strategic initiatives to, close, to cause the decline to turn around? That is to say the decline in the oil sector as distinct from the natural gas sector. Now, it is unlikely that a 25% claim instead of 20% of expenditure on development activity for mature fields and enhanced oil recovery projects as a credit against a supplemental petroleum liability will make any decided impact on exploration and development. And it will have no impact on the ultimate result, really, either in terms, well, not, not in any real terms, really. And as I mentioned, from my reading of it, it affects only the oil sector, not the natural gas sector. So I would submit, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that a more multi-pronged range of solutions might be required to stabilize and energize the energy sector. The changes in Section 16 of the Income Tax Act can have a material impact on companies. So let us look at the implications. The 16.1 now reads, subject to subsection 2, where the amount of loss incurred in the year of income in any trade, business, profession, or vocation carried on by any person, either solely or in partnership is such that it cannot be wholly set off against its income from other sources in the same year. The amount of such loss shall, to the extent to which it is not allowed against its income from other sources for the same year, be carried forward and shall, subject as is here under provided, be set off against what would otherwise have been his chargeable income for succeeding years. That is 100% write-off over a period. The difference in the proposed section is that it now reads, subject to subsection two, where the amount of a loss incurred in the year of income in any production business carried on 
by any person, either solely or in partnership, is such that it cannot be wholly set off against the income from other sources for the same year, the amount of such loss to the extent to which it is not allowed against his income from other sources for the same year be carried forward and shall subject as is hereafter provided be set off against up to 75% of what would otherwise have been his chargeable income for the succeeding years. Now what is happening here is that there's a limitation on loss from 100% to 75%. I know the government has made heavy weather of this in the past. But we must ask the question, will this affect some of the com companies negatively? In the energy sector, quite frankly, I don't think it will. I mean, they have deep pockets, and they will address these issues. Um, but we are dealing with a situation in which the competitiveness of the energy sector is an important issue. And I simply raise that. I have no doubt that they probably consulted with the energy companies before coming to the parliament with such a measure. And I imagine that there has been an understanding and an agreement reached. And if that is the case, then that would be a good sign and good for the country. So I hope that that was done. But this provision preserves the indefinite carry forward of any unutilized portion of accumulated tax losses, but it restricts the utilization of the losses against taxable profits to 75%. In other words, dropping it by 25%. The restriction is limited, and this is important, to production businesses only, and will not apply to the, private, to the manufacturing sector or any other sectors. So as in the case where we were talking about oil only, not gas, we have a situation in which we are talking about production only, not manufacturing. So any ad additional revenue generation will come solely from production companies in the energy sector. The reversion in capital allowances to a straight line basis of 20% per year for five years will help government cash flow, but it makes no difference to the companies. The minister admitted that they are going to benefit from the cash flow, and that is true. But it will make no difference to the companies because they are still paying the 20% year by year for five years, so they simply pay in equal tranches. The government has been talking about the energy sector and its importance and the importance of this sector from, time, from the time they got into office, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Since that time, it is my view and the considered opinion of the members of the opposition on this side that they have made a mess with the energy sector. I simply mention Dragonfield. I will not say anything about it. I mentioned train one, I mentioned the methanol industry, I mentioned the other downstream industries in Point Lisas, I mentioned the last bid round which was a total failure. Yes? Your initial speaking time has elapsed, you have an additional 15. You care to avail yourself? Kindly proceed. The last bid, bid run was a total failure. They have done nothing whatsoever to, to incentivize new drilling and new investment to address the value chain industry issues industry-wide. Petroleum production is at its lowest level. And of course, we have the colossal failure of Petrotrin. together with AV drilling and the pending closure of Yara, while Heritage and Unipet are in an unequal conflict on future directions for the retail industry in Trinidad and Tobago. What the country needs now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is a formula to bring stability, predictability to the energy industry. 
which so far has been elusive to this government. So we have had plenty talk, and we have had limited action and intervention. But what you need is a team that knows how to work and get things done. Clause 5 drives from page 139 of the budget speech, where provision was made to allow for the importation of 5,000 TT worth of goods increased from the previous limit of 3,000. We have no problem with that, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And the, the clause six deals with the debt benefit increase from 5,000 to 50,000. We have no difficulty with that. But I do want to acknowledge the value of that increased benefit to the members of the cooperative society and credit unions. And I would add that the increased allowance to citizens returning from travel abroad, abroad would be a much better thing if the customs lines and the immigration were better managed with the traveler in mind, if the passport renewal and issuance system were more efficient, timely, and effective, and if customer service to the citizen were delivered with greater consideration, care, and diligence. Now, let us see what we have here. These are meant to be stimulus measures in the fifth and last budget of the administration on the other side, led by the honorable member for Digo Martin West. And they are meant to move the country to solar heating for water, to incentivize energy, and energy exploration and development, to incentivize creative industries by giving tax credits, and to incentivize man manufacturing services and agricultural exports. What have been just some of the harsh realities of the last four years of this Rowley regime at the hands of the Minister of Finance, Mr. Deputy Speaker? While these incentives are being provided now, the approach in 2016 and 17 was to impose higher taxes on businesses and to buff up the energy investors. <laughs> we really have a case here of in 2019 going into 2020 of too little, too late, with the, with the damage already done. The net effect of the high taxes, the buffing up, and the lack of policy clarity was to undermine confidence, which is needed for investment, recovery, and growth, and to initiate a period of economic decline, business closures, job losses, stresses on home mortgages, economic contraction outside of the energy sector. The one plus during this period was the increase in natural gas production and revenues from this increased production and that was set in motion by the 2011-2014 decisions of the Kamala Passad Bissessa government when they opened up very successful bid rounds for the energy sector. These have been yielding fruit since the third quarter of 2017 and are keeping the country financially afloat now and will continue to do so for some time, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But the taxes set in motion in 2016, the sometimes arrogance of the Minister of Finance, the buffing up by the Prime Minister and the rest of the government front bench, the policy contradictions, the abusive tone of the government generally, and the fear of government reprisals has elicited a retreat for survival by the business community. Everybody in Trinidad and Tobago freed the government. <laughs> and if the UNC was not here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if the opposition was not fearless in the face, in the face of allegations, accusations, and branding as unpatriotic, no. the Rowley government would have run riot in this place. Yeah. The opposition under leader Kamala Passad Bissessa has been a genuine and real check 
on government expenses in Trinidad and Tobago. And the experience of the last four years has been a series of contradictions and policy clashes that have forced reasonable people to ask, does this government know what it is doing? Does this government know what to do? And they are now in a situation where they are now figuring out how to move into the future. The poor and the vulnerable are at their wit's end, and that includes thousands of unemployed youth. The working class feels more oppressed today than in the 1930s and in the late 1960s with the draconian legislation. Every day they are worried about their job. Yesterday was Yara, the day before was Petrotrin, today is Unilever, tomorrow, who knows? The middle class cannot enjoy their normal lifestyle and their children are educated but without jobs and when in jobs without opportunity for mobility. Small and medium businesses are in survival mode, choked by foreign exchange shortage, refinancing, cutting back, beginning to see now only hope in the rising sun. The upper echelons of society are worried about the dwindling options and whether social unrest can be kept at bay. Everyone is fearful of the runaway mur murders and dismayed at the un inability of the government to make any dent in this at all. All we hear is talk and more talk, explanations and articulations without result. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I talked about policy contradictions. I know I just have a few minutes. Would, would you let me know how much? I have a total of seven minutes. Yeah. yeah. The, we had, for instance, what we had in the first two years were corporate, corporate taxes, 25 to 30%, banks 35%, 30% on those making profit of a million and more. You had the business fund levy, green fund levy. You had VAT reduced, but across the board, uh, all the zero items included. And then you had the problem emerging of refund. And what you have here now are incentives for agriculture, which is now postponed to September 2020, incentives to manufacturing services, Exim Bank, you had the Exim Bank export allowance. And the problem here with the policy contradictions, Mr. Deputy Speaker, was that the taxation took away the confidence that was necessary for the incentives to work. Had the government done the other thing, which we in fact advised them from 2016 on in the budget, and given the incentives first, and they had begun to prosper and export and do better, then you could have maybe addressed the issue of taxes afterwards. So they mismanaged the policy matrix having to do with incentives and taxation. Then one of the issues also is this issue of fossil fuels and moving away from energy. So you, the energy sector, as I mentioned, I don't have time for that, is not settled. It remains in a situation of relative disarray. And there are a lot of people that are very, very frightened in the energy sector right now. But you have a situation where you have the removal of fuel subsidy, LED lights, solar water heating, removal of taxes on hybrid vehicles, removal of, of incentives, but you also have CNG with that. And you also, so you, it's not clear whether you're going CNG or you're going electric or you're going with both and therefore each one takes a set of resources. And then there's the removal of the incentives on the higher end, the hybrid vehicles. If you have a policy, you cannot do that because what it then is that it then skews it. Um, and what we have ended up with is that we have had no coherent strategy 
having to do with climate change or sustainable development and so on. They have good public relations on that and they have made some international, their international presence felt. No, nothing uh, wrong with that. But in terms of actual policy here, as to how it affects the fossil fuel side of the energy industry and how it gets you into green industries that are new for diversification and transformation, nothing on that. And then I have a news clip here, September 17, 2019, in which the Minister of Finance is basically touting the idea that we have a million cards of the road, on the road and that is positive on the economy. When the whole purpose of your climate change policy is to curb emissions and secondly, to make sure that it does not happen where it's happening most, which is in the cars and in the energy industry. And the energy sector, again, you have the policy incoherence there, which is um, there is no holistic approach to the sector. There is uncertainty about uh, LNG exports versus downstream. There is no Guyana trust. There is no renewable trust. The, if you take the basics of human existence, air, all right, the clean air, there's no concentrated strategy for that. If you deal with the, the matters related to food security and moving it in a direction of sustainability, there's no concentrated trust on that. If you take the housing stimulus, as an opportunity for the government to use. And we have two more minutes. Yes. For, to use government housing as a means of triggering that something announced in one of the budgets. There is nothing like that. And if we go to basics as water resources management, I don't want to get into that. We know what the problem is here. In the drought, it's too hot. We have no water. In the rain, it's too much water. We flood it out. You know, so. And there are other issues I just want to say very quickly before I complete. Having said all of that, there are still issues with the price of oil in the budget, $60, and the price of natural gas in the budget, $3 per MMBTU. And I have the, the documents here which tell you what the prices have been like for, for, the, little while, for the while, and I think we have a problem with that. We have a problem with the, uh, we, we have a problem, as I said, in the whole energy sector. And uh, there's very little more that I can say. I have one minute, I do want to say one thing. The monetary policy report came out yes, yesterday. And in this, it tells you in graphic detail that we are in a lot of economic and financial trouble, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This was done yesterday. It was on the website yesterday. I don't know if they had a launch, but I picked it up yesterday. And what this tells you is that we are in a lot of economic and financial trouble. I underline the areas. I don't have time to do it. But what I would say to the population is, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that you made a choice a few days ago, thank you very much. And I want to say that you will have the opportunity for choice again. Take a look member, at the monitoring report. Member, member, yes. I told you clearly you had two minutes. Yes. Right? And if you check the time, the two minutes is up. All right. Thank you. Right. Before, before, before I recognize the Attorney General, again, during uh, the discourse for the member for Carney Central, I allowed a lot of comments and feedback and so on. Please keep it minimal. I'm not saying that you all cannot talk among each other, but keep it minimal, the little outbursts on both sides. So again, Honorable AG, I recognize you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I listened to the member for Carney Central literally in a state of shock. And I'd like to reflect upon something that someone sent me today, telling me what I ought to expect in relation to the commentary coming from the opposition. And this comes from a very reputable, distinguished person, who I won't name, not in a member of the parliament, saying that 
The opposition will seek to trade on the psychology of fear. They will see poison in every glass of water, danger behind every bush, and seek to dampen hope and expectation so fear can take a hold. I could not imagine a more appropriate description than that as it relates to the contribution coming from Carney Central. I want to remind this population that Carney Central, as the Minister of Planning in the last government, was the proponent of something called growth poles. We're going to have growth poles in Trinidad and Tobago. Cable car running from up in the hills down to Port of Spain, a tunnel passing through the Maracas um, structures of rock and foundation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Ministry of Planning has the responsibility for a lot of the articulation in the financial arrangements in this country. And the one thing that the population understood is that the growth poles were quickly dubbed greasy poles because not one policy identified in that regime happened. I'm, I'm, I'm compelled to address a few things. This member says that the Honorable Prime Minister and that the front bench has buffed his word, the energy sector. And, a, and he said that the country is afraid and the energy sector is afraid. Is, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, he said that there was no holistic approach to energy. I want to put on record now, on coming into government and realizing that there was absolutely no cohesive understanding at the Ministry of Energy. No form of contract on the left hand compared on the right hand, evidenced perfectly by the CGCL contract, where the last government saw it fit to take a greenfield structure, tell one company, CGCL, that they will get a guaranteed gas supply for all of their needs, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and that if they don't get the guaranteed supply of gas, that they will in fact pay for the losses as a result of the loss of gas. So that member, the member for Kearney Central, stands here today to tell us about an holistic appreciation of the energy sector when that member sat in a cabinet that granted the CGCL position. Let me remind this country further. On coming into the office of the Attorney General, my colleague, Minister Stuart Young, and I discovered the Solicitor General's advice in writing. In fact, in red ink. And in red ink, the Solicitor General, when pressed by the Attorney General to agree to the CGCL contract, the Solicitor General, the public officer holder, the senior legal officer so recognized in the Constitution, put in red ink for that honorable member that there will be no position of opinion affirming that that contract should be signed. Because a public servant stood up and said it would be effectively insanity to guarantee the gas behind the CGCL if you can't supply the grass to have a take or pay arrangement and this member comes today to tell this country and this parliament that there was no holistic plan as if there was one? Mr. Deputy Speaker, if that contract had not been renegotiated by the diligence of the Prime Minister and my colleague Minister Young having to jump on a plane to go to Japan to meet with JBEC, the bank in, J in Japan, to plead the mercy of common sense, to say, mea culpa, the country was effectively intellectually vacant and lacking in management to sign that contract, to ask them to renegotiate the contract, we would have shut down the entire Point Lisa's industry, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And this member comes today with the intellectual audacity to tell this country that there's no holistic plan. If that is the case, explain how the Honorable Prime Minister and a delegation had to go to the boardrooms in Europe, in Australia, in England, in the United States of America, agree to get variations on the back of moral suasion to allow us to get a different structure in our gas pricing, 
to allow us better participation in LNG, in cargo management, to bring home to this country $2.1 billion gratuitously because there was no legal obligation to get that done. How does a prime minister go from alleged buffing, as Carney Central wants to portray it to be, to the manner in which our honorable prime minister attended at these meetings and had a voluntary repatriation of monies amounting so far to $2.1 billion. You see, it comes back to the bad news selling. I mean, this member says the country has spoken. Yes, the country has spoken. Traditionally so, we had a local government election. We had a roughly 34% turnout. We have our colleagues opposite effectively enjoying almost exactly the same position as before. Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is a party on the opposite side that lost 30,000 votes from where they were on the last occasion to come and tell us that they are preferred. You see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Honorable Member said something, saying that Petrotrin saying that Petrotrin, I want to I get to this, Petrotrin and AV drilling. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is now a matter of public record in relation to AV drilling that the Commissioner of Police Financial Investigation branch came to the public domain and said publicly that their preliminary findings demonstrate absolute fabrication in allegations made against the Honorable Prime Minister. Let me repeat that. The independent authority of the Commissioner of Police, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, came to the population via the head of the financial investigation branch to put an end to the allegation of A and V drilling. And no doubt I expect the final word to confirm that, all things being equal. The Honorable Member says Petrotrin is a disaster. And yet these Honorable Members are the ones standing against the patriotic investment by the OWTU. These members are the members who are now crying doom and gloom in relation to that investment. These members witnessed the Prime Minister taking a tough decision, and yes, there were consequences. Who better to know of that than me, as the Member of Parliament in an area close by? These members watched $2 billion a year falling through the cracks, watched as they have now the ability, if they are honest, to testify an, inc an increase in revenue coming from the Petrotrin entire structural re readjustment, coming to $750 million in advances, coming by way of profit. That money expected now to settle contractor debts, contractor claims. But my, Mr. Deputy President, Mr. <coughs> Deputy Speaker, and forgive me, I sit in both houses and confuse the chairs at time. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know what I find there's great audacity in? Here, the Honorable Member, the Monetary Policy Report came out, and he just read it yesterday, and he skipped past You know why the Honorable Member skipped past it? Because the Monetary Policy Report, Mr. Deputy Speaker, which I have in my hand, says nothing of what the Honorable Member said. He sought to refer to it in the end of his contribution, passing over some pages, and I'd like the Honorable Member to have the intellectual strength, if not certainly decency, to at least go to what is contained at page 18 of the Monetary Report. You see there, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they talk about revenue, 2015-2016 to the government of Trinidad and Tobago, 44.972 million. A thousand million, that's billion. 2016, 36 billion dollars. Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know what this reminds me of? You know what a band of marauders look like? An indisciplined bunch that arrive in a restaurant, order an entire menu of food, eat out the people's food. Paid for. <laughs> um, in reference to what exactly? Band of Band of Who was he referring to? Overruled? Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't, I have not referred to my learned colleagues. 
I don't know why my friend seeks to associate herself with the description I'm giving now. The people of Trinidad and Tobago know very well what a locho is. You know what a locho is in, co in common parlance? The people of Trinidad and Tobago understand what it is like to watch somebody descend into a place, arrive and eat out your food, refuse to pay the bill, walk out and leave the bill for someone else, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And when these things happen, I, I can only say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that sense is often picked from nonsense. And the reality of the proper management of this country has been left solely to the Honorable Prime Minister to direct our cabinet to manage. And I would like to say that as the good news begins to unfold with rapidity, as Petrotrin in particular and in the examination of its non-core assets and in its refinery operations as they are sought to be managed in the circumstance of having a preferred purchaser on the table becomes more and more a reality. I just caution the population that my friends opposite seek to see poison in every glass of water, mm -hmm. proverbially. A threat behind every bush, intellectually. They ask the citizens of this country to ensure that they have no faith. They will look for the shattering of confidence in this country. And I found it quite interesting to hear Karani Central. Hear Karani Central. Karani Central says that um, there is stability to be had in the measures offered by the last government. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member had the audacity to say that under Kamla Passad Bisesa, the management of the energy sector was so good that it resulted in bid rounds, and that this is why the country is succeeding. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I say to the most absent leader of a political party, never present in the, part, in the parliament, and on a day to day, I wonder why, I wonder why I say, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that... Again, members, before the AG started this discourse, I highlighted certain points. Please, member for Princess... Just hold on, hold on, hold on. Again. Proceed, member. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm hearing across the floor that somebody is ill in the leader of the opposition's family. I don't pretend to know that. If that's the case, then c'est la vie. We offer our support and strength for our colleague. However, today aside, the leader of the opposition is constantly absent. And that is a fact in this country. And I say so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in answer to the submissions coming across. The records at the parliament are on the Hansard, and the records at the Cabinet and its subcommittees are at the Cabinet Secretariat. And the records demonstrate that the Energy Subcommittee of the Cabinet, which the Prime Minister of the country chairs, demonstrate that the member for Separia did not attend a single meeting in the entire tenure that she sat as Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And that is demonstrated, Mr. Deputy Speaker, by an by a fact which must be put in answer to the submission coming from Karani Central. Karani Central says that the bid rounds are so successful that we are now reaping the rewards of the decisions taken by Mrs. Passard Bissessa, the member for Siparia. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Energy Spotlight, the Honorable Prime Minister, the Minister of Finance have repeatedly demonstrated and publicly spoken without a word of contradiction from my friends coming opposite, that had we left what was put in place supposedly by Siparia, we would not see a cent in revenue from the energy sector until 2024, 2025. And I asked my colleagues opposite, how are we supposed to run a country without revenue? How do you manage to keep your expenditure 
as is shown at page 18 of the monetary report, as a percentage of the whole pie, expenditure, current expenditure, 32.1%, wages and salaries, 6.3%, goods and services, 4.8%, interest payments, 2.5%, transfers and subsidies, 18.4%, cash capital expenditure, net lending, 2.9%. Mr. Deputy Speaker, where is the money coming from that if you accept the economic policy of Carney Central? Because Carney Central sat right there in watching the removal of the benefits which the country would have had, in allowing for tax write-offs to be accumulated in one year and carried forward year after year without relief. And today the Minister of Finance comes in the Finance Act to release us from that form of prejudice to take the yoke off the back of the country, and the member is intellectually bold-faced enough to tell this country that that is a bad move. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I just reject everything that Karen Central has said right out of hand. And I reject it because it is said in a sober tone with a few highfalutin words, but at the end of the day, when you strip it down for what it is worth, it is intellectual fabrication, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So let's get, let's get, you'd like to say something? Thank you for giving way. I was saying, um, honorable member, that you would not know what fabrication is because it is natural for you. I, I wouldn't even raise a standing order on that, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's, it's childish and puerile. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if I may. You would have given way, right? Currently, centrally responded. And again, other than he's given way, I'm not tolerating the additional outbursts. Can you proceed? Both sides. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, hear my colleague opposite, Speaker on the bill. Don't respond, eh? Don't point out the intellectual fabrication and intellectual nonsense that is passed in this country. Don't respond to that. Respond to the bill. No, sir. I take no advice from you and the greasy pole philosophy that was offered by you. None. Mr. Deputy Speaker, let's get to the realities. The honorable member has just clean, you know, I sat quietly during the contribution. Eh? So clearly I'm doing the right job because my friends opposite can't take it. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when we look to the structures in the insurance restructuring of tax benefit, you know, it may be lost certainly on Kearney Central and perhaps on, certain, on, on other people. The percentage of contribution to GDP right now for the non-energy sector is significantly larger than the energy sector. The energy sector at present contributes roughly 27% of our GDP. And a lot of people have not realized how far diversified our economy has become. When you look to the monetary report, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and you look at the monetary policy report, volume 21, number two, November 2019, produced by the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago in particular, and you get to the domestic economic conditions at part three, beginning at page 12, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you look at what the index um, references are across it in the domestic economic conditions, real economic activity, retail prices, producers' prices and building materials, labor market, fiscal operations. All of them tell a story different to that offered by Kearney Central. Labor market, and hear this, latest official labor market statistics from who? The CSO. The Central Statistics Office, which went out of operation whilst my learned colleague, Kearney Central, had the responsibility for that. The, the entity was shut down, as a matter of fact. We were relying upon statistics from the Ministry of Finance, all of which had to be restated when the reality of the CSO came back into existence. Here it is, labor market, latest official labor market statistics from CSO indicate that unemployment rate declined to 3.8% during first half of 2018 compared with 4.9% in the same period 2017. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, 900 people fewer were, were unemployed. It says producers and retail prices, again demonstrating an uptick. It says real economic activity in the non-energy sector, preliminary estimates suggest some improvement in the finance subsector during the first six months 2019. Finance sector experienced a pickup of 1.4% on account of growth in the commercial banks, non-bank financial institutions, insurance, real estate, dwelling subsector. Economic activity in distribution sector grew marginally over first half of 2019, as evidenced by an increase in CSO retail sales index. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what does that mean to the average person in Trinidad and Tobago? Gobbledygook. So we can sit here and look at the fact, the fact that the numbers have gone in the right direction. But at the end of the day, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what we can say is that it is a matter of incurring the wrath sometimes of some hard decisions to indicate that you want the right thing prudently. The honorable member said that Paria was in a war with Unipet. Let me address this for a moment. The Honourable Member says that, and he knows fully well, that Unipet is a wholesaler alongside NP. NP runs more stations with greater overhead in a structure that Unipet does not have to manage. Unipet manages 24 stations. Unipet receives a credit arrangement where it receives up to 60 days, no obligation to pay roughly a tanker a day. So by the time 60 days passes, you're paying for the first tanker that passed every day for 60 days on a wholesale margin arrangement where you pay cash at the pump, where you tell us run a country that is prudently managed, collect your revenue, and there's somehow some odium in paria calling upon NP and Unipet to have their currency of payments managed? In which business environment that Kearney Central promotes? Is it acceptable to have $160 million outstanding? 172. In which, 172, in which business environment, in which la la land that the honorable member was just speaking about, does that make good business sense? You see, you ask the government to take prudent steps to make right decisions, you know for in this factual scenario of Unipet actually making more money than NP, that NP can afford to stay open, but I don't know what interest the honorable member is batting for. I don't know. I know he acts as consultants on some occasions, the honorable member. I don't know if that is in his portfolio, but what I can tell you, economic management and prudence dictates that you watch your receivables. Mr. Deputy Speaker, because when it's time to pay salaries and people want to know why on paper you have money, but in actuality you don't have it in your pocket, it's because if you're slack and fast with your finances, if you give away a billion dollars in bond payments by changing a contract term, if you don't watch your receivables, you will end up in a situation where you have money on paper and nothing in your pocket, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, let's turn to the insurance industry. The history of the insurance amendments, of course, we know the Insurance Act was born in 1980. That Insurance Act has been the subject of supposed amendment for a full 38 years. The Insurance Act in our country, where the insurance sector contributes a vast amount of our GDP. There's seven active life insurance companies, seven composite insurance companies. And the last data coming out of the Central Bank in 2010 because they, they do it in cycles, demonstrates that back in 2010, nearly 10 years ago, total long-term TNT policy holding liabilities in 2010, 9.6 billion. Total assets pledged in statutory fund, 1.6 billion, 11.6 billion. Total premiums, 1.5 billion. Total transfer to profits and loss accounts, 346.2 million. Net interest, other non-premium income reported for all classes of long-term business, approximately 675 million. So the honorable member ought to know the size of that industry. 
the Honorable Member says, well, effectively, nothing is really happening in this amendment. That's what the Honorable Member said. He called it a sideway management. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the history of birthing the new Insurance Act is quite an interesting one relevant to this debate. The Insurance Bill 2011 was brought by the members opposite. Lapsed June 2012. Insurance Bill 2013 lapsed July 10, 2013. The bill in Insurance Bill number 2, 2013, lapsed July 30th, 2014. <coughs> Insurance Bill 2015 lapsed June 17th, 2015. With JSCs being established, I sat as a member on those JSCs. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, I can tell you, the record demonstrates that the UNC's approach towards the reform in the industry was simply that of delay. Because the operationalization of this law requires you to do a number of things. The act had to be passed. When we came in in 2016, we caused the first reading. We immediately went to a joint select committee. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, we had 10 meetings there, ending in July 2017. We saw the third reading and passage in May 2018. We assented to the bill. And in the meanwhile, something which was lost in this debate happened. We did the final set of amendments to the in Insurance Act. They are now laid before the Parliament. They're on the table of the Parliament. I won't anticipate the bill by speaking about it. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, we laid all the regulations in the sector. All, all 10 of them. And that is very important to demonstrate because when we are looking at protection of the shareholder, if you want to use that expression, the policyholder, in particular of long-term insurance products, including annuities, because they, they are interpreted that way, they define that way, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you have to settle not only the regulations, but also the corporation taxes. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, clause three of the legislation today deals with the corporation taxes aspect so that we can get on with applying the insurance industry solution. And that is so because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, it coincides with the Clico restructuring. It coincides with the sale of, by central bank, with the sale of the traditional long-term insurance policies as the central bank undertook that exercise. It coincides with making sure that the industry does not collapse in fear. And I can tell you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have laid the we have ready for laying associated with these amendments we make today the insurance capital adequacy regs 2019, the insurance Caribbean policy premium method regs 2019, the insurance financial condition report regulations 2019, the insurance participating account regs 2019, the insurance approved securities regs 2019, the insurance companies registration regs 2019, the insurance pension fund plans regs fees regulations 2019, the insurance pension fund plan investments regulations 2019, the insurance intermediaries registration regulations 2019, the central bank payment of supervisors fees and charges amendment regs 2019. That didn't happen by mistake. Somebody had to do the work. And if the honorable members opposite would not do the work, it fell to us to do the work. And I can tell you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they just don't care about that. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, that is important because in coming up with the recommendations for the corporation tax fourth schedule amendments to bring the taxation of insurance policies, insurance companies into line, we had to have consultation. The consultation was had with Attic. It was had with the Central Bank. It was had with the Actuaries Association. And we have adopted in this legislation in this bill before us, a method which ensures that we don't shock the industry. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, I can tell you that the bill is underwritten certainly by three. Michelle, 30 minutes speaking time has elapsed. You have an additional 15. Avail yourself. Yes, please. Proceed. I can tell you that the bill is underwritten firstly by a number of sections in the Insurance Act 2018. Firstly, Section 42.1, secondly, Section 83.2, and thirdly, of course, Section 281 of the Insurance Act. 
What we seek to do in the most simple terms, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in ensuring that we remove the statutory fund, because the statutory fund in the 1980 law was established as a minimum threshold. You'd have a very large insurance company with $2 million in, in capital. It, there was no maximum done. In birthing the Insurance Act 2018, we have gone to capital adequacy. What does that mean? Policyholders' liabilities must be matched with assets. And what we do is to manage the asset pool by ensuring that you have reporting requirements as to your exposure on assets and liabilities. And in causing that reporting cycle and the methodology, we allow for the introduction of the actuarial input, but we don't slavishly take it to the United Kingdom or Canada model because it's just too complex. We've looked at the Barbados model, etc., and what we can do here is to simply ensure that there is a reasonable taxation on the insurance products, assets that underwrite liability in a way that is familiar to the industry. And what does that mean, Mr. Deputy Speaker? It means that we are proposing to cover management of assets and liabilities in a known structure. We also, very interestingly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, see the hole that was created in the transitional provisions. When you're looking to the provisions to speak to how foreign insurance companies, take Sajiko, for example, under the Insurance Act, foreign insurance companies have an obligation within 18 months of the proclamation of the law to reincorporate themselves as Trinidad and Tobago companies. That's not a difficult aspect. You can find yourself as an externally registered company under Part 10 of the Companies Act, and you can bring all of the advantages of external registration via local corporation. Mr. Deputy Speaker, what we do is that we ensure that long-term business is managed in the same way it always was. The types of products, ordinary life insurance, general annuity basis, we bracket those as together in one class. Industrial life, bond investment business, non-cancelable -cancel sickness and accident. Again, we require the consistency of separate classes to be carried on. Approved annuity business, well, that one does not apply, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We have adopted the model of net investment income basis. We have rejected in this bill the concept of profits based on actuarial surpluses because they're just simply too complicated and too um, expensive to operationalize. And what we do is we basically say, make sure your profits on the assets supporting policyholders in Trinidad and Tobago prevail. Make sure that income shall be credited to the Trinidad and Tobago revenue accounts or such other policy accounts that may account for investment income attributable to policyholders. And lastly, men maintain the link to the regulatory requirement by referencing the requirements in sections 83.2 of the Insurance Act to maintain assets to support liabilities. In short, Mr. Deputy Speaker, our consultation has said from the industry, from the actuaries, that there is resounding support for the measures that we have put forward. But Kearney Central wants to pass that off as something simple. If it was so simple, why could the honorable members not pass the Insurance Act 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015? Why could they not bring the 10 regulations? Why could they not amend the Corporation Taxes Act? Why could they not have the sensitization and operational structures? You see, they just talk, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We accept that the people of Trinidad and Tobago are hungry for their turn at the wheels of success. We accept that we have an obligation to produce that for them in a measured, sustained way. But what we have from the members opposite is an attempt to pour scorn at prudent economic management. I want to tell the country today respectfully through you. You know what the honorable members opposite tell us in the corridors? Pat you on the back. Boy, it's a good thing you deal with Petrotrin, you know. It's the right thing to do, but we ain't had the guts to do that. Yep. Pointer Pay himself. Yes. The member for Pointer Pay himself yes. has repeatedly said when? that I didn't see you in the and Mr. Deputy Speaker, whilst the charade 
of scorn goes on, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'd just like to tell the honorable members opposite, not everybody in this country is stupid, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are people that pass themselves off for elder statesmen who just can't take pressure. I don't understand it. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when we deal with existing and proposed differences in the insurance structures, I'd just like to say this. When we deal with the methods currently in use, what we have done is to put methods that the industry understands well. Methods that don't scare the industry product. We are accelerating to the operationalization and proclamation and implementation of the Insurance Act 2018 in particular. It's a large part of our GDP. It is time that we had policyholders underwritten by assets which match their liabilities. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it's not often that I have the opportunity or the task to correct what passes for contribution. Today is one of these days where sometimes the sword has to be drawn and it has to be swung. And I know that members opposite will be upset at hearing the truth, but I make no apology for that. This is the right form of measure. I warn the population not to fall for the doom and gloom of the proponents of that opposite and simply to stay steady and focused as prosperity is delivered with certainty, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank you. I recognize the member for Karani East. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I wonder if the members of San Fernando West ever attempted to read this bill whatsoever. <laughs> Because the member, obviously, except for the last five minutes, spoke about the bill. But for his contribution of 40 minutes, he evaded the bill and, in fact, landed it as a finance bill, which I will speak to and re I'll respond to some of the statements that he made in his presentation. For a while, Mr. Speaker, the member for San Fernando West was sounding like an injured person who is in fear that the seat is slipping away after Monday's results. Becoming ferocious with rage. <laughs> and I wonder whether he was ready like a predator to pounce on his prey. <laughs> yeah, I wrote it, so I don't want to misquote. Yeah. I, I wrote it. Mr. Speaker. Members. The results of Monday's election has the have the member for San, F San Fernando West, Bazodi. <laughs> and when you're losing your grip, you become angry, this is as exemplified by the member for San Fernando West. And just a while ago, he said, we talk. The electorate said that they talk, but we work. <laughs> And want to get at the leader of the opposition and our political leader is the same leader of the opposition and our political leader that trounced the PNM in Monday's yes. election. Yes. 202,584 votes yes. for the UNC versus 161,960 votes for the PNM. 41,000 votes more. That is what the leader of the opposition and our political leader did to the PNM. She trounced them yeah. fully on Monday. Now, what is even more important? <laughs> significant grounds in San Fernando where <laughs> three seats, three electoral districts in Tonapuna. Grounds in Tonapuna. Remember, one second. One second. I've given, I've given each member a little leeway with regards to what you are talking about now. Again, right? No, 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 listen, understand what I'm saying. I've given each member the opportunity to say what they have to say on the elections, but I'm not going to entertain any long discourse. Proceed. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker. I just want to say, under the leadership of the opposition leader and political leader, onwards to victory in 2020. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you Speaker, we have been for year after year on finance bills and midterm review of the finance. And on this, in the public, we hear, I'm responding what the member for San Fernando West said. We hear about, they came, they entered this parliament on fumes. We left nothing for them and they had nothing to work for for the people. But we have told this public repeatedly that we left approximately $117 billion TT for them with 11.5 billion US in foreign reserve and 5.6 billion US in the Heritage and Stabilization Fund, equivalent to approximately $117 billion left for the PNM government when they came into office in 2015. How can they, with any moral conviction, say that we left, we left the country as you? These are the facts, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In addition, we had to deal with $25 billion with a CLECO mismanagement under a PNM government, which two senior members of this government had been a part of. And we had $7 billion owed to contractors when we came in. So we had a debit of $32 billion to deal with. They also were receiving another $15 billion within six weeks of coming to government. So that myth and the fallacy that they have been perpetrating and perpetuating against the opposition when we were in government is furthest from the truth. And, the, and, and it, is, it is shameless, Mr. Speaker. And that ought to stop. After four years, they continue to make, and this is the fact at which I have given to the, to the country today. And where is the foreign reserve now? From 11.5 billion in 2015, when we demitted office, is now 7.1 billion dollars US, 4.4 billion less. That's equivalent to about 32 billion dollars TT, less in foreign reserve as of October 2019 by the Monetary Policy Report. So my colleague is asking, telling me to say, where the money gone? Where the money gone? You have, they have spent almost $230 billion so far. What have they got to show for it? Night upon night in the, in the platform, they had nothing to show for it, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So they re reverted to other types of propaganda. I want to continue to respond to the member for San Fernando West. On this, we had no holistic plan on energy. We had no holistic plan on energy. Which is the government that gave the impetus and the, and, and, and the, the plans to the oil companies and the gas companies to increase production? So that today in, 20, in 2014, in 2018, 2019, we were able to benefit more than 300 um, cubic, cubic feet of gas per day, as opposed to 3.6 billion, um, is it billion? We know 3.69 billion dollars. It was the, the work of the People's Partnership Government, the Honorable Prime Minister, and the Minister of Energy at that time that gave the incentives so that the, we can reap the benefit in 2018, 2019, as we are reaping, reaping, reaping now for the increased production of gas. I, we don't know what, this, what the member was speaking about in terms of the energy sector, but I want to draw an analysis or bring some information on response to the issue on Petrotrin, when he said that they had the courage to close down Petrotrin. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And Mal uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Madam Speaker, 6,500 people lost their jobs. Over 100,000 people in the various communities around there began to suffer as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And the contractors 
where thousands of people, the subcontractors, also lost their jobs. So in total, about 10,000 people lost their jobs, and they showed their displeasure about it in the recent voting that took place around those areas. I don't think they have any moral authority to talk about anything with Petrotrin again. Because they, they witness under the work of the former PNM government, about $40 billion had been lost as a result of the Malcolm Jones fiasco. $40 billion. So that they took a loan in 2008 of 850 million US, which we, we now have to renegotiate again and take back the same loan at 9.5% interest, which they took at 9.5% interest in 2008. So we would have paid 95% of interest on 850 million US which is equivalent to about 825, 830 million US that we would have paid in interest, which Malcolm Jones and the PNM took at that time in 2008. So 800, 800, 000, 800 million US multiplied by seven is 5.6 billion TT in that loan alone, which we have paid in interest. And for the next nine years and eight years again, we have to pay the same interest plus the principal of 850 million. Where are we getting that money from? This is what Malcolm Jones and his team at that time put Petrotrin through. And so it's a $40 billion fiasco which this country has inherited as a result of that. And I'm not, I have not even included the 750 million which they took out in 2007 for 15 years. And we have had to pay interest on six and a half percent, seven and a half percent for, fifth, for um, 2007 to two, that's 12 years. At seven and a half percent, that's about 90 percent. 90 percent of 750 million dollars US is equivalent to about 630 million US, equivalent to 4.2 billion US. So just on these two loans alone, the 850 million US and the 750 million US, we have had to suffer about $10 billion in interest alone, Madam Speaker. And all, we're not speaking of all the, of all the, the, the um, investments that they made in Petrotrin, in the low ultra sulfur diesel, in the um, world GTL plant. They lost billions of that, about $15 billion. So this country is suffering today as a result of the mismanagement of the PNM and the mismanagement of the government between 2015 to 2019. So they have no moral authority at all to speak on Petrotrin, Madam Speaker. They should be ashamed of their performance, in fact, in the energy sector over from 2008 to 2010 and 2015 to 2019. If it were not for the People's Partnership government under Prime Minister Kamala Prasad Bisesa at that time, we would have been in a worse position now having, if we didn't put the right measures in place to give impetus to these companies and for, dr for, um, for drilling and producing. I heard a member for San Fernando West speak about the CSO. And I want to respond to that. When the Minister of Planning under the People's Partnership Government was in his last year as Minister of Planning, member for, the Gomati, for Karini Central, the then administration opposition attacked him viciously on the CSO business, saying that he couldn't do anything for the CSO and they were housed in, 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 in places which were not suitable. But when this government came into power in 2015, they promised something called the National Statistical Institute, which would replace the CSO. Four years have gone, and the work for that replacement is nowhere in sight. 
And I can't quote more because I am on the joint select, um, a special select committee on it, but I can speak on the CSO. The CSO has already, has alre already given up its responsibility to the Ministry of Finance. And so when figures come out from on, on, on national statistics and so on, it's coming from the Ministry of Finance, not the CSO. And therefore, the population has to be very wary of what is being put as national st statistics. They will conjure up anything, and they will put anything to suit the population. It is not coming from the CSO at the moment, Madam Speaker. The CSO seems to be um, absent from any, any sort of statistical data. Let me respond to the bond payment issue. They have been speaking for the last four years about this bond payment on the extension of the highway to Point Forte. And they always saying that we left the whole thing in a mess. Madam Speaker, let me make it abundantly clear today. If it weren't for the People's Partnership government at that time to introduce the clause that ensures that OS had a billion dollars in bond, and that was, in, that was in signature, that a bond of $1 billion was there, mm -hmm. so that if they relinquished their job and their work on the project, that $1 billion would have been available to the country, and we would have forfeited that $1 billion. Mm -hmm. They go up and down the country today saying that they secured $900 million, the contract. The contract. Yeah. But the contract had the $1 billion bond payment. So they're trying to fool this country to tell the country that they have received, if it weren't for them, they would not have gotten that $900 million. What a fallacy, yeah. Madam Speaker. And what an untruth they continue to tell to the population. That $1 billion bond was secured by the People's Partnership government in the contract with the OAS. So I'll put that. The other thing they go about yeah, speaking yeah. about the cure up interchange. And they said that the cure up interchange went down from $520 million to $220 million. No contract was signed whatsoever with the cure up interchange. So how can something go down from $520 to $220 when no contract was signed with it altogether? All so that's another fallacy and another con job they have tried to put onto the population within the last two years, and which we cannot accept, and which we must denounce. Which we must denounce. And December 2nd, they were exposed. <laughs> the last area I want to respond to the Minister of the, the, Minister, the Attorney General and Member for. Um, um, San Fernando West, the Insurance Act. He spoke about we didn't do anything about the Insurance Act from 2011 to 2015 and so on, and we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't complete it. A lot of work was done by both Ministers of Finance, Winston Dukaran and Larry Hawaii. But they have had five, four years so far, they complain about 11, 2011 to 2015. They had four, we had four years. But they have had four years so far, 2015 to 2019, and still today, Madam Speaker, the Insurance Act is not proclaimed. Yes. Chapter 84.1, it was re that act was repealed and replaced by Act Number no. 4 of 2018, and assented to on June 2018, a year, almost a year and a half ago. And all type of excuses coming from that side, that the central bank and different players now are telling them that they didn't. They didn't anticipate this, so the regulations have to be altered and so on. And this awaiting proclamation. So almost four years have gone with this Insurance Act under their watch. This, we still do not have an Insurance Act. It was repealed and replaced in 2018, but not proclaimed as yet. So they have no moral authority to speak on that whatsoever, Madam, Madam Speaker. The member went on to speak about diversification, that they have diversified this economy. What? what? He said that, really? Yes. So, so unfortunate <laughs> that the member could make a statement like that. The whole country knows that there has been no diversification in this country between 2015 to 2019. 
they can't tell us what they have diversified, Madam Speaker, <laughs> because if they could have done so, they would have done so. <laughs> and he spoke about the lab labor market. Yeah. I think it is shameless to speak about the labor market in Trinidad and Tobago now under their watch. More than 65,000 people have yeah. lost their jobs, yeah. Madam Speaker. It is painful. 65,000 people have lost their jobs and they have echoed their feelings through December 2nd. Much more will be echoed in 2020 when the next time comes around. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 75,000 people have lost their jobs and more coming. You have Yara, people lost their job recently. Unilever, people lost their jobs. Unipet to come, people will lose their jobs. Uh, Madam Speaker, what is happening to this country? So, I can't understand how the member for San Fernando West will get up and make these statements. Uh, yes, uh, is my friend, but he cannot continue to make the statements that he made. He must be, he must be stopped. With yes. it. All of you are supposed to be our friends. We are political foes, but we, we, we don't, we don't, we carry our friendship together. But we are political opponents. You want, we want to be, to run this country in a proper manner, as you have not been running this country in a proper manner, and give the people what they deserve. So, Madam Speaker, the bill now. In the presentation of this bill, Madam Speaker, the Minister of Finance was very quiet. And it was a welcome sight to see him relatively um, poised and, and docile and, and, and made a good presentation. So there, this um, bill, Madam Speaker, has seven clauses, has seven clauses, and really moves around five, um, five Amendments to five pieces of um, legislation. The Income Tax Act 7501, Corporation Tax Act 7502, the Corporate Societies Act um, 8103, and the Petroleum Taxes Act 7504, and the Customs Act 7801. I, I just want to make a few comments on the first one, um, the, on the bill, which is Clause two, Madam Speaker. Clause two amends the Income Tax Act to provide for an increase in the solar water heating equipment tax credit. Madam Speaker, we have no difficulty in that whatsoever. We knew that this in the budget statement by the member of um, the Minister of Finance, when he was coming to the end, he spoke about these things that he has to introduce on January 1st as all ministers of finance have the responsibility to do. But we, are, we have some questions for the minister of finance. This act says where an individual in a year of income commencing 1st January 2011 purchases solar water, heating equipment for household use, that individual shall be entitled to a tax credit, which was 48M in 2011 of 25%. Now they want to change it to 100% of the cost of the solar power, solar water heating equipment up to a maximum of $10,000. We heard the minister speak about it, but I want to ask the question, minister, why did you look at just solar water heating alone as a, a forward thinking, if you're supposed to be forward thinking, why didn't you look are the whole question of solar power electricity generation for households. Why stop short on just solar water heating? That's a small aspect of moving the country to away from the fossil fuel. And in terms of bringing us to renewable energy consumption, I want to quote from a World Bank um, report, and the, the, the data is dataworldbank.org indicator, EG, FEC, MEW 25. And it shows Trinidad and Tobago, 
the most recent value of renewable energy consumption is 0.28%. Whereas Latin America and Caribbean is 27.60%. A far cry where we are. And uh, if we were the government at, that, at, at this time, as spoken about by the, 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 the Minister of Public Utilities, I want to quote what he said recently. Renewable energy by 2021. Government sticks the terms of Paris Agreement. It was reported on Saturday, June 8, 2019 in The Guardian. He said within the next two years, 10% of the country's electricity will come from renewable sources. According to Public Utilities Minister, by 2021, TNT must become more dependent on renewable energy because of the United Nations Paris Agreement for the lowering of greenhouse gases. And TNT became a signatory to the agreement on February 22, 2018 in New York. And he indicated that he wanted to reduce the effects of global warming and to adapt to the effects of global warming and climate change. But just last week, <coughs> Costa Rica announced it would be the first nation in the world to be carbon neutral by 2021. One of the most influential factors in their carbon st status is that 98% of their electricity comes from renewables like hydropower, wind, solar, geothermal, and biomass. In fact, the only fossil fuel used by Costa Rica is diesel. So it's in that context, I take a, a little um, introspection into the thinking of the finance minister when he was preparing this budget for implementation in 2019. Why did he fall short of what could have been a more purposeful move to give some incentives for solar power generation of electricity to homes and business places and to government businesses and government offices and so on? so that the dependence on electricity generated from natural gas would be reduced over a period of time. They have fallen short because in 10 years we project that the amount of natural gas will be falling and therefore the generation of electricity will become much more expensive. So when are we going to start the movement away from the fossil fuel into the renewable energy. We are now only 0.28% where we're supposed to be. In terms of Latin America and Caribbean, as I said, 27.6. The world is 18%. And even Jamaica is 16.77%. United States is 8.72% and so on. Canada is 22%. So, the minister has an opportunity and the government has have an opportunity to deal with that issue in a more comprehensive manner. And our political leader, a leader of the opposition, in her response to the budget, the same budget we're speaking about, the budget statement, which the member for the Minister of uh, Finance has to implement, in her response to the budget, fiscal 2019 to 20, on Friday, 11th October, 2019, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition said then, in contrast to what they are bringing for the country, she said, we will establish a solar energy park in Tamana Intec Park. We will invite private investors to establish a solar tech park with the Tamana Intec Park. The solar tech park will develop energy efficient modular solar solutions, which can be retrofitted to existing buildings or integrated into new construction projects and used in several other areas such as marine, communication and transport. The leader of also mentioned the provision of specialist turnkey energy solutions to communities within the Caribbean region, 
establish a green building in incentive program using minimum amounts of energy, consumer, consuming less water, generating less waste, and creating space for healthy and comfortable living. And public housing developments built by the HEC or other government agencies will be outfitted with renewable energy. Another point was develop a policy for feed-in tariffs to encourage the use of renewable energy technologies. And with these in initiatives, by 2025, the leader said, member for Separi, we will create 3,500 new jobs, cut fuel bill by 500 million, and raise share of renewable energy to 5% of consumption. So obviously, the Minister of Finance did not have the advice that he probably needed to have when he was bringing this piece into the finance bill. But we are telling this population that the opposition now, and the leader of the opposition, has a plan to deal with the renewable energy component and the reduction in fossil fuel energy for the country. So, Madam Speaker, um, just next door in Haiti, they had the solar-powered hospitals in Haiti, and so they're yielding sustainable savings. So across the world, people are moving to that at the moment. Um, the Minister of Finance, I think my colleague, mem the, the uh, member for Karenish Central, made mention of what this bill says, income tax is amended in section 48C. But 48C, M Minister of Finance, was repealed by Act Number 9 of 1997. So you may have to make an amendment subsequent to the amendments that you have put forward here that is not, um, is not amended in 48C. 48M was replaced it, where an individual in a year of income commencing 1st January 2011. Member for Carini, yeah. please. Your original speaking time is now spent. You're entitled to 15 more minutes to complete. Might I ask if you're going to use up the entire 15 minutes? Yes. So, members, can I ask that the member be allowed to complete his contribution before we go to tea. It will take us to five minutes to 4.35. Okay, so please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank colleagues and, and the House. The, um, the next um, bit, uh, clause in the, this Finance Bill 2019 is the Corporation Tax Act. And the Minister went in detail and speaking about the um, what they will, how the, the different sectors of society will benefit from um, tax allowances in various areas, namely um, foreign markets for the export of ar architectural engineering, design, quantity surveying, or contracting services on, in connection with the building industry, where such services are performed by a person resident in Trinidad and Tobago for a recipient who is outside Trinidad and Tobago. So the tax allowance there um, is accepted, and we, we agree with it. There's no question. And we agree that tax exemptions should be, continue to be given for the various areas um, in, the, in the various subclauses. Um, promotional expenses in, the, in, the, in order to create or promote the expansion of foreign markets. Um, the other one is petroleum operations, but we, we come back to that. Artistic work, creative industries, fashion industry. And so the question arose, this corporation tax is amended, but the same corporation tax, Madam Speaker, this government raised the corporation tax to 30% from 25%. So on one hand, the Minister of Finance is coming to say that we'll grant some concessions on tax allowances for various categories in the creative sector, in the production of goods and services, in the manufacturing sector, in the agriculture sector. In, on one hand, you're coming that to do, say that in 2019. But in the previous two years, you raised the corporation tax from 25 to 30%. You know that's what a contradiction. What a contradiction. 
You know what ha that has caused to a number of small, medium business enterprises with the increase in corporation tax on 25 to 30%, and a 300% increase in the business levy fund, and the, um, the other one was the, um, there was another increase of 300% in another, in another category. So which would have caused these businesses, small and medium businesses, to really recoil and have difficulty in paying Yeah, and you have examples of them now that they have, and when you walk or move around this country, you would see a number of small and medium businesses have closed and places have, have gone for rent. And we have spoken ad infinitum about the infrastructure, the, the decrease in use of cements, the liquidity in the market, people cannot buy homes and so on. Yeah, and a lot of businesses have gone into receivership. And I just took the opportunity to look at what the TTMA had to say when they raised that corporation tax to 30%. Sure. The TTMA is concerned at the perceived attempt at harmonization of corporation tax to 30% across the board. We are of the opinion that this measure can have the deleterious impact of stifling the capacity and growth of small and medium enterprises that are already challenged with depressed local and regional market conditions. This was stated on Monday, October 2nd, 2017, in an interview on CNC3, the Trinidad and Tobago Manufacturing Association. Yeah. Okay, so, member, for Karenese, if you could tie back in quickly um, what you're doing now, and, and continue to address the bill as you were doing before, please. Back into yeah. the fact that the Minister of Finance is coming late in 2019, 2020, to say that he's doing something for the manufacturing sector mm -hmm. by these Sorry. small allowances, but he has decimated the small and medium businesses over the period of time by increasing the corporate tax. When the rest of the world have gone to 15% like the United States and so on. The next um, clause, Madam Speaker, is the, um, not the corporation, the, the Cooperative Societies Act. We have no difficulty with that. That we, we hope that people will benefit from that because to give 5,000 on the passing of some member who has been with the cooperative, that is, um, we are happy that they can secure that 50,000 now. The Petroleum Taxes Act, are moving it from 25 to 30% allowance, that is neither here nor there, because we have spoken about the destruction of the whole oil and gas sector by this administration. And uh, the Petroleum Ta Taxes Act, we asked the question in response to what the member for the San Fernando West was speaking about, that the Prime Minister went to various countries around the world and negotiated the prices of natural gas with these international companies and came back to Trinidad and he was saying that they received $2 billion as a result of that. But what has happened? The price of the natural gas sold by NGC now is higher than what it ever was. And the supply to the the, the downstream industries became chaotic and more expensive for them. And so a lot of them have now folded up, under folding up, like Yara and some other of the other downstream industries. So you negotiated something and you're saying that you went abroad and negotiated um, a benefit for the country by working with these international oil companies. But at the end of it all, the price that NGC now paying for the natural gas is higher than it ever was, and the downstream industries are suffering as a result. Would you say that has benefited the country? Absolutely no. So what was the mission of the Honorable Prime Minister and, and his team at that time? I think the member for Port of Spain North, St. Anne's West, was part of that team. 
but they have not been able to tell this country how, they benefited, how the country has benefited when the price of gas went, went higher. Madam Speaker, the Customs Act, in terms of moving from 3,000 to 5,000 for people coming into the country, is acceptable, and we, we echo our sentiments that we are in support of that. Um, the issue, though, few people are bringing things into the country when they travel now, eh? and we don't know because they're buying everything online, mm -hmm. and millions of U.S. dollars are spent online, billions now, mm -hmm. as a result of the opening up with Amazon and other companies and so on. So people Alibaba. now are refraining from even having to travel with heavy things to come into the country mm -hmm. and not utilizing this. So even though the Minister of Finance has proposed this, we don't know what benefit it is to the country, but to the citizen, I don't think it is of any major benefit to them in terms of moving it from three to $5,000. Madam Speaker, the last point I want to um, ask the Minister of Finance to um, answer. This issue of the sixth schedule, countries in respect of which tax de deductible promotional expenses and market development grants may not be claimed. I know we operate within the CARICOM community and the CARICOM countries like Antigua, Barbados, etc., St. Vincent, Jamaica, when we export to them, we were not able to derive any benefit. In, um, the exporters were not able to derive any benefit from exporting to these countries. He has now brought in the, the situation where if you're exporting for the first time, you will benefit by exporting to these Caribbean countries. But it is unclear that if they continue to export, would they continue to benefit? Or is it only the first time that they're exporting that they will benefit? I think the Minister of Finance, if he were here and he was listening, uh, we would like some um, clarification on that issue because there are many manufacturers who only export to the Caribbean countries and they will probably be uh, finding it difficult as to understand where uh, we go with that. So Madam Speaker, in closing, this bill, we understand why the Minister of Finance has to come with it today to make sure that it is implemented for January 1st, 2020. We're in support of a number of these things, but the question is that they could have gone further, and if they were really serious and a government that was purposeful, they would have made some significant improvements in the things that they are promising <coughs> for the country. And so therefore, when they speak about, when the, the Attorney General speaks about uh, all this diversification and we left the, fi the country in a bad, fi bad financial state and so on, is all ludicrous. And therefore, the people of this country know where we were and where we're going to be in 2020 with a new UNC yeah. government. Yeah. Honorable members, it's now 4.31. Thirteen minutes past 13. So now we'll take the suspension. We will return at 5.05. This house is now suspended.